Welcome. Be sure to like and subscribe for more scary stories. Or I will come for you. Story number one. I started doing it on a whim. My brother has an unhealthy obsession with online bloggers. I can barely go a day without him linking me to a video of someone taking part in some sort of challenge or performing some social experiment. So when the whole deep web mystery box trend started, I was one of the first to know. My brother must have sent me dozens of videos of annoying preteens opening up boxes filled with junk that they tried to pass off as creepy and sinister. When my brother asked me for my opinion, I told him that it combined all the boredom of an unboxing video with all the stupidity of the Tide Pod challenge. I added that most of them were probably making the boxes themselves. Even I could do it, and that's when the wheel started turning. A quick search confirmed that this was a growing trend, with hundreds of people claiming to have opened up boxes containing everything from drugs to murder weapons, to mysterious flash drives. Some vloggers even claimed that they had spent thousands of dollars on a single mystery box. Those were obviously fake, but what about the rest? Were there really people out there who would spend at least a hundred dollars for the chance to go viral? I bet they would, and unfortunately, I was right. Bringing the boxes together was easier than expected. I had some cardboard boxes stuffed in my closet that turned out to be the perfect size for the job. Some rusty screwdrivers proved perfect as my murder weapons. My desk drawer offered a surplus of random old flash drives that I made mystery box ready by filling them with many creepy videos which I downloaded. Finally, some expired sinus tablets provided me with some mysterious deep web drugs. Once I had peeled off the labels, getting the website set up on the deep web was a little harder. But you can find an online tutorial for anything these days. By the time I was ready to go to bed, I was the proud owner of the Emporium of Mysteries. For $50 worth of Bitcoin, anyone could be the proud owner of a mystery box. Sure, the site looked like it had come straight out of the early 90s, but it was good enough. I was in business. The next morning, I went looking for customers. Fortunately, my brother's messages had made me very familiar with the online vlogging community, and I messaged a few of the smaller channels with some burner accounts that I made, and left a few comments on the latest videos. You should do a deep web unboxing video. You know what would be really cool? Unboxing something from the deep web. I bet you'd get millions of views. I heard about this new place on the deep web called Emporium of Mysteries. They sell mystery boxes there. You should check them out. Then all I had to do was sit back and wait. By the end of the day, I had six purchases. Not much, all but together, but enough to help put food on the table. By the end of the afternoon, I had the boxes ready to ship. I wasn't looking to scam these people. After all, they all got to make their stupid videos, and I got to eat. Everyone was happy. I sold a few more over the next few weeks, but eventually, interest died down. Life went on, and my brother sent me more stupid videos. I gradually forgot about my time as a deep web merchant until last Friday when I got home from work. There was a package waiting for me outside my apartment door. When I picked it up and examined it, I realized it was one of my mystery boxes. It looked like I had one unhappy customer, but it wasn't like they were getting their money back. I took it inside and opened it up. It was empty, save for a flash drive that I did not recognize. I was curious about what was on it, but I wasn't about to let some disgruntled hacker infect my computer. So I dug out an old laptop that I hardly used anymore and plugged it in. It was full of pictures. Pictures of my hometown, of my apartment, of me. Whoever sent me this had been following me. I started to realize just how out of my depth I was. You see, not everything you find on the deep web 
is fake. There are some people out there who do sell real mystery boxes, and they are tired of scammers like me taking away from their profits. Thankfully, they are also very generous people and want to give me a second chance. So I'm pleased to announce the Emporium of Mysteries is under new management. Now, for the same low price, you will receive a genuine mystery box. It will include a special tool from my new partner's personal collection, along with the video instructing you on how to use it. Co-starring myself, the body part or organ extracted during the video will also be included as a special memento. Supplies are limited, so search us on the deep web as soon as possible. We look forward to your patronage. Story number two. I work for a huge company that helps bring down bad websites on the web. I cannot reveal the name here, but I have been doing this for many years now. A few years ago, I discovered a group of red rooms called the Five True Red Rooms on the Deep Web. Now don't go looking around trying to find them, because you won't. A true red room cannot be accessed through Tor. If you try, you will just set yourself up for getting a crappy virus on your computer. I have been told that they are scams, but rest assured, a few of them are not, and it is very hard for an individual who doesn't understand the concept of the five true red rooms to try and break in. Let's just say you have to know someone that runs one of them. It cannot be accessed through Tor. You have to know or be lucky enough to get a passcode to be let in. You have to be proven trustworthy. In this case, I gained the trust of someone who helped moderate one. The true red rooms are a series of five rooms, sort of like doors. If you can gain access to the first red room, you pay Bitcoin and show that you are serious. Then you may get permission to access the second room and so on. Watch these evil live streams, I'll tell you. Here is the first true red room. I clicked on the first screen. The black box appeared asking for my passcode. I typed in my username and the unique access code and was given access to the site. Permission granted, it said. That was it. I thought it was too easy. On the first page were a bunch of black video boxes with titles. Some of them were videos titled Watch Me Scare Kara or Tiffany Gets Spooked. I clicked on Watch Me Scare Kara first. A man with what seemed to be a cell phone camera is pointing it towards the front door. He is inside a home. It looks like he is hiding behind a door and I can see the living room furniture. A nice leather, love seat, and bookshelves are in the room. He is whispering in a foreign language that I cannot understand. He never shows his face. Suddenly, the doorknob is turning, and I hear keys rattling. A girl in a green nurse's uniform with blonde hair and tan comes in. She is petite-looking. She is probably in her twenties. Suddenly, I hear a man's voice scream. Don't move. She froze like a deer in headlights, and then screams and drops her keys. A man in all black and a black ski mask is running towards her with a giant hammer. Her arms go up. She screams to block him, and he smacks her in the head twice with the hammer. She's forced to the ground, and blood pours on the white carpet. She's completely knocked out. The man points to the man who was hiding behind the door and says what sounds like the word done. Both cameras are shut off. If this was real, it was the most disturbing thing I'd ever seen. I didn't know what happened next. I could only imagine. I didn't even want to click on the second video, but I did. The next video is called Tiffany Gets Spooked. It was even worse this time. The camera zoomed in on what looked to be a park. A woman with brown hair and a blue jogging suit is running laps around a track. The foreign-sounding guy is sitting in what appears to be his car, and I can see the cracked windshield. He is wearing black gloves, but never shows his face. 
He is laughing and talking a little, and the girl is still jogging. I wanted to yell for the poor girl to run away and to get out of the park, and I realized there was nothing I could do. She wouldn't be able to hear me. Suddenly, the camera shuts off. I think the video is over, but I was wrong. Very wrong. The video comes back. What looks like night vision. It is green and a little choppy. I can see what looks like a bunch of pine trees around. Then I see what the camera is focusing on. A girl is in what looks like a trunk, and she is trying to scream. Her legs and arms are tied and bound, and her mouth has a gag in it. It looks like the same girl from earlier in the blue jogging suit. She is barefoot. I can only see the black gloves in her hair. We're looking on. It looks like the same guy from the earlier video. He is in all black and is gently brushing her black hair, and the man holding the camera is telling her to calm down in English. She is crying. Then he begins to pull her body out of the trunk. Thunk. He bumps her head by accident on the trunk lid. I feel relieved, thinking it's all a joke and that she will be okay. Suddenly, I feel sick. I can't believe what they're about to do. The man in black with the ski mask lays her on the ground, and she gives up crying and starts screaming. The camera zooms in on her face. The lights go out on her and all I can see is darkness. Poor girl has lost all hope. I want to cry, and I fight back tears. They begin to tie her wrists to the bumper of the car. The cameraman is still there, holding the camera. The other man gets in the car. I hear the engine roar. They were going to drag her behind it, and with that, the video cuts off. Story number three. It's not a very debatable topic when people say that the internet has infiltrated practically every aspect of human life. The internet is everywhere, zooming around us, passing through us, teaching us, and more interestingly enough, changing us as beings. Astral projection has been a part of human culture and mythology ever since humans first began living on planet Earth. Different ancient cultures have drawn different pictures of aliens in UFOs or cave wars. And all over the planet, independent of each other's stories and myths. Recent developments in certain areas of fringe science tell us that it's possible that alien abductions and astral projection are inseparable experiences. That alien abduction is only possible through an altered state of consciousness like astral projection. Although in most people nowadays, due to the internet, at least something about what astral projection is still clouded within myth and confusion. How have humans, from indigenous tribes to iPad addicted first graders, experienced this phenomenon without hearing stories of it previously? It is very hard to deny that astral projection is anything less than a very real and natural experience. In 1968, Charles T. Todd did an experiment on a woman who claimed to have an out-of-body experience every night when she slept. Over a period of four nights, he conducted this experiment and found that during astral projection sessions, the participant reported leaving her body, floating above her bed, and being able to read a five-digit number placed overhead. The five-digit number matched the one written down by the psychologist. Although this experiment has been picked apart many times, it is still fairly conclusive based on the results of the experiment that an out-of-body experience could very well be the cause, ruling out telepathy. Astral projection has been conducted many times almost all with shocking and seemingly conclusive results. Like many metaphysical topics, however, it is hard to prove anything completely. But I don't have to rely on these experiments, because I experienced out-of-body phenomena fairly often. Now, back to the interwebs. Astral projection is when you lay in your bed, and your soul or astral body leaves your physical body and is able to explore the world free from physical restraints. 
You can see the Great Wall of China. Check on your boyfriend or girlfriend to see if they're cheating on you. And accidentally catch your best friend masturbating when she thinks that no one is watching. Kind of creepy, right? And anyone can do it at any time. With all of these things you can do, it seems like no one in their right mind would waste such potential for fun by spending their out-of-body experience surfing the internet. But that's what I did, and that is what my story is about. I woke up in the night with a tingly feeling over my body and a loud humming in my ears. I felt alert and awake and full of energy. Without thinking, I got up and went to my computer. But my computer wasn't my laptop. It was an old monitor with a rounded glass screen. I realize now that it was the archetype of the computer. I guess the collective unconscious of people visualizes a computer as an old Windows machine. I looked back on my bed. And yes, like I thought, I was astral projecting because I touched the mouse and the screen lit up, revealing an old cluttered desktop with a green background. The OS looked like a mix of Windows and Mac OS, which I thought was very cool. During astral projection, you are fairly conscious, and some report the dream to be even more vivid than real life. Usually, everything is the same as the real world. Experts in the field believe the astral realm exists all around us as a kind of fourth dimension. Invisible yet very real, existing as an energetic copy of everything in our world. There were strange programs on the desktop. Some looked like old prototypes of programs like Microsoft Word or GarageBand. Some of the icons that had never been designed showed a small square photo with a skull and small blocky words underneath it that said no icon. I clicked on Internet Explorer 1 and a black box popped up and displayed a white loading bar. Do you remember going on the internet on phones before smartphones were around, and how all the pages were simplified into blocks of text and images? That's what this looked like, an old cell phone's internet rendering skills. The tail of the mouse pointer dragged for a very long time, leaving a slow streak of white flowing. Every moment, it seemed like everything in the computer was being played in blurry slow motion and looked very airy. Everything was black, green, and gray. I clicked on the search bar, and a list of popular websites came up. I clicked Google, and it took me to the page, but the word Google wasn't in colorful letters. It was just black Helvetica that said Google very plainly. I clicked on the search bar, and it flashed black, and nothing happened. I tried to type, and no letters appeared. So, I went to the above search bar and tried to type again. Nothing happened. So, I guess you can't type anything in Astral Google. It kind of blocks you for some reason. I looked at the list of popular sites, then clicked one. It kind of looked like Twitter if it was on the dark web. It took me to a page that looked like Twitter but there were no background images, and the bird in the upper corner looked like an emoticon bird, and everything was typed in white blocky text against a black background. I saw a list of celebrity usernames, and then to the right, shockingly enough, my username. I clicked it, and it brought me to my Twitter page, but my profile photo was a very low-resolution image of an eye. Very strange, very creepy. The eye was looking straight at me. I scrolled down the page and recognized every tweet, but none that I had actually ever tweeted. Then I realized each tweet was something that I had meant to tweet about, but forgot or decided against it. Somehow, it had been sent here. I clicked on my photos and blurred gray dot gif images labeled with pixelated numbers. Each one was geolocated to the place I had posted it even though I always make sure geolocation is disabled on my phone and computer. I randomly clicked the link and was reminded of the no sleep shadow of the story because the world displayed was a pixelated video of someone making cuts on their arms with a knife. 
and beneath the video, people were typing things like cut deeper or cut the vein. I felt sick and scared, and I went to click the X button, but my mouse glitched and made me click the next com button below it. What I saw still freaked me out. I saw a man's wrist tied up to a chair, palms down. The camera was right up to the man's hand, and another person was using needle-nose pliers to rip and pour the man's fingernails off. A loud screaming sound suddenly boomed up the computer's outdated speaker system, making my ears hurt and my heart leap into my throat. My blood pressure was sky high, and the man on the screen continued to pull the fingernails back. What I make of this is that the shallow web, being such a dark place, had made a permanent mark on the internet archetype and exists there. Astral projectors can go to view it in their sleep. I pressed the print screen button and copied it to the paint program, printed it out. I was thinking that this one actually printed, not in the real world. I was thinking that I had to show this to the police. I was too freaked out to think about how logical this was. The printer did its thing, and I went to press the monitor power button to try and wake up from this. But then I saw a folder on the desktop labeled Humanity. Its icon looked different from the others. Nervous, I clicked on it and found many folders with names. It was almost like it had named everyone at birth. I clicked the first letters of my name on the keyboard, but the screen flashed black like it did before. So, I scrolled down until I hit my name. There were about 20 entries, so I expanded the date created tab and found the one with my birth date on it. I clicked on it, but it wouldn't open, no matter what I did. It wouldn't, and the screen just flashed black every time I did. So, I decided to look at my grandpa's folder. He had died years before, so I scrolled down and found him. As soon as his folder opened, a video of him popped up on the screen. He was crying and shaking and yelling. The sound from the speakers was terrifying. It sounded like a mix between a computer glitching out, an air horn, and a human screaming. I couldn't have exited the tab fast enough. I sat there, crying and shaking, wondering why that happened. As soon as I got up the nerve and clicked on another random person's folder, all it showed was a picture, as if taken from their webcam, of them calmly surfing the web. In the folder, there was a text file, and when I opened it, it had info about them, why they were born, and when, and under death. There was nothing. I decided to see what would happen if I clicked on someone else who was already dead. So I put in H.P. Lovecraft's name, and immediately a video of the man himself screaming and shaking violently, with his eyes bulging out of his head and his mouth wide open, came up. I closed it quietly and realized that everyone who was dead had a video file in their folder instead of a picture. For some reason, an image I had seen on Tumble popped into my mind. It was a picture that said, what would the world look like? if we could see internet and radio transmission waves, or something like that. There were great fuss lines through everything, and somehow I made the connection that, because of the waves from Wi-Fi, radio, and cell phones, when we die, they surround and torture us because they penetrate the astral world as well as the physical one. I turned off the monitor and buried my head in my hands taught myself to wake up, and suddenly I did. In my own bed, it was about three in the morning. I was shaking all over, and my mouth had that all too familiar watery feeling. I tasted it, and I immediately vomited all over my blankets. I was scared walking through my house. I felt like something was there with me, and everything I saw was racing through my head. I didn't sleep at night and the buzzing and screaming sounds were all like they were there. The thing that horrifies me the most is that the next morning, I saw a piece of paper face down in the printer. I picked it up. It was the photo I printed, 
only completely gray, with faint lines running through it, and my laptop computer was extremely hot. I truly believe in astral projection now, and ever since, I've been researching it like crazy. Most of the time, I'm too afraid to sleep because I don't want to astral project again. I don't know what caused me to think that radio waves or Wi-Fi can actually torment our souls when we die. But every time I see a cell phone, I imagine data waves floating out of it. What if it's true? Why would everyone who had died been screaming? With everything good, the internet has brought us, I keep thinking. What if there's something darker about it? Something evil about it on the metaphysical level? What if humans were never meant to get this far technologically? What if we were never meant to get this advanced? I never want to astral project again. Story number four. In the year 2009, Gilberto Valor was a 25-year-old police officer living with his elderly father in the New York City borough of Queens. As you can imagine, law enforcement is an extremely demanding profession, and it gave Gilberto very little time to do anything else. After grueling 14-hour shifts, all he wanted to do when he clocked off was collapse into bed and sleep like the dead. On his off days, he found himself far too exhausted to socialize. This left Gilberto in something of a predicament. He longed for a romantic partner, but simply didn't have the time to look for one in person. So instead, he put his faith into the online dating website, OCupid. This is how Gilberto met Kathleen Mangan, an elementary school teacher who had recently settled in East Harlem. They hit it off fairly quickly, and after just a few months of dating, they moved into a small one-bedroom apartment together near 88th Street and 3rd Avenue. It was nice at first, Kathleen later recalled. We laughed a lot. But things changed after I got pregnant. After breaking the news to him, Kathleen expected Gilberto to be happy. Instead, he seemed horrified, repeatedly saying, I can't do this. I can't do this, as Kathleen later explained. After calming down, he called her parents and assured them that he'd do the right thing. The apparent change of heart was a huge relief, but Gilberto's newfound fatherly enthusiasm was disappointingly short-lived. He drifted away from Kathleen so slowly, she almost didn't notice until one day he just didn't seem interested anymore. Many blamed Gilberto's behavior on the stresses of being a new parent, and he seemed to prove his detractors wrong when, after moving his nascent family into a larger two-bedroom apartment in Forest Hills, he asked Kathleen to marry him. Their wedding was held on June 19, 2012, with their nine-month-old daughter Josephine being the unofficial guest of honor. Making things official seemed to renew Gilberto's fatherly instincts at least temporarily. However, he soon sank back into the same patterns of disinterest and sorely neglected his wife and daughter. He rarely helped with the baby, and when he came home from the precinct after midnight, he'd stay up until 4 a.m., 5 a.m., sometimes 6 in the morning playing video games or browsing the internet. As far as she knew, Gilberto spent most of his time online browsing sports and policing forums. But during the summer of 2012, Kathleen walked in on him doing something else. Having worked as a teacher for the better part of a decade, Kathleen possessed an impressive level of computer literacy. When she walked into Gilberto's office that day, she recognized what he was doing. A mass erasure of his internet browser's search history Upon hearing her enter the room, Gilberto quickly minimized the browser window and pretended to have been doing something else. But Kathleen had no doubt, and she found herself gripped by nail-biting curiosity. A few days later, following Gilberto's morning departure, Kathleen crept into his office and logged onto his computer. I noticed that there were two little image files at the bottom of the screen, she said. So... I opened them, 
The images depicted an extremely disturbing variety of adult content, yet they also struck Kathleen as horrifyingly different from anything she had cursory knowledge of. I've read Fifty Shades of Grey. I know what that stuff is, Kathleen said. But this was different, because the girl in the pictures, she was dead. There was a time when a more insecure Kathleen had believed that Gilberto's dispassion stemmed from her lack of attractiveness. Yet, following the disturbing discovery on his desktop computer, she realized something was very wrong with her husband. She sent him a text message that simply read, We need to talk. When Gilberto returned from his shift that evening, he seemed visibly nervous. During the confrontation, Gilberto broke down into tears and claimed that his interest in such deeply disturbing adult content stemmed from his inability to deal with stress. He promised to visit a therapist and swore he'd never visit any such websites ever again. I thought maybe we'd had a breakthrough, Kathleen later said. We were communicating. He was being honest. He was talking to me. But for the rest of that summer, I couldn't stop thinking about what I saw. Finally, on September 9th, 2012, Kathleen once again crept into Gilberto's office while he was at work. This time, on the advice of some online cybersecurity experts, she installed a discreet form of spyware on his computer. I had no choice, she said. I was scared, and she was right to be. The following day, Kathleen used the spyware to find out which websites her husband had recently visited. What she found was nothing short of horrifying. The names of the websites were chilling, but what truly turned Kathleen's stomach was seeing what her husband had been getting up to. I started going through his instant messages, she said. Then all of a sudden, I'm staring at pictures of myself, pictures of my friends, pictures of other people we knew. Gilberto and his anonymous online friends had been fantasizing about tying Kathleen up, hanging her upside down, then cutting her throat with a razor-sharp knife. They said it would be fun watching the blood gush out of me, she later said. Another person said, if she cries, don't listen to her, don't give her mercy. And all my husband had to say in response was, don't worry, we'll gag her. But that wasn't all. As Kathleen continued to scroll through Gilberto's messages, she uncovered an appalling escalation of their fantasy. They didn't just want to kill me, she said. They wanted to cook me and eat me too. Upon realizing that her life might be in danger, Kathleen immediately booked a flight to her parents' place in their home state of Nevada and took baby Josephine with her. Gilberta remained blissfully ignorant of her discovery and continued to browse violent imagery online. He googled things like how to kidnap a woman and best human meat recipes. He also kept a secret folder hidden away among a veneer of innocent sounding directories in which he kept photographs of the women he'd like to murder and cannibalize. Many were athletes and actresses but many included his wife's family members, friends, and co-workers. One picture was captioned, I'll be eyeing her from head to toe and licking my lips, longing for the day I cram a chloroform-soaked rag in her face. It was now impossible for Kathleen to discern her husband's sick fantasy from palpable threats to the safety of her loved ones. So, with a heavy heart, she reported Gilberto's activities to the police just a few days later, during the early afternoon of October 24. Gilberto was enjoying a day off in his Forest Hills apartment when suddenly his phone began to ring. Gilberto didn't recognize the number, nor did he recognize the voice on the other end. Ah, is this Gilberto? The stranger asked. It is the man himself, replied Gilberto. I'm sorry to tell you this, buddy, but I got this number from your insurance company, the stranger explained. Someone's hit your car pretty bad. By the looks of things, you're home right now, 
by any chance. Gilberto didn't bother to answer the question. He simply ended the call, then walked outside with a furious urgency about him. Yet, when he arrived in the apartment complex's parking lot, he saw that his car hadn't so much as a scratch on it. Confused, Gilberto turned around to walk back inside, but found his path blocked by three sturdy-looking men in suits. Gilberto Valla, one of them called out. It was not a question. They knew it was him. We're from the FBI and would like to ask you a few questions. Following a brief interrogation, Gilberto was placed under arrest. Shortly afterward, he was charged with conspiracy to kidnap his own wife, Kathleen Mangan. Investigators soon discovered that there was no shortage of evidence and began cataloging emails. In many of these emails, Gilberto made it abundantly clear that he was ready and willing to abuse his authority as a police officer to lull potential victims into a false sense of security. This is what made the case all the more disturbing, said one U.S. attorney following Gilberto's arrest. When you consider Val's position as a New York City police officer and his sworn duty to serve and protect, it makes what he did unforgivable. By the time Gilberto's trial commenced, he had gained worldwide infamy as the cannibal cop of New York City. Yet, as the judiciary set about determining his guilt, the court of public opinion was concerned with something else entirely. To the public, it wasn't what Gilberto was being accused of. It was what he might do in the future should he either beat the charge or receive a lenient sentence. Never in my career have I ever hesitated to tell the marshals to take the handcuffs off the client when I'm interviewing them one-on-one, -on -one, said the federal attorney who defended Gilberto. And this was the first time in my career I'd ever, for just a second, thought about keeping the handcuffs on. Yet, to some, this could be interpreted as a shockingly prejudicial statement. After all, Gilberto wasn't on trial for anything he'd actually done. He was on trial because of something he thought about doing. The prosecution sought to paint Gilberto Valor as someone fully committed to living out the fantasies he'd fostered online. But where exactly did he go to indulge such lurid and bloodthirsty thoughts? One of the websites Gilberto visited the most was named the Dark Fetish Network. The FBI estimated that the network was comprised of over 50,000 unique users, and although its homepage bore a disclaimer stating fantasy only, it was clear that many users practiced their proclivities on and off the internet. Gilberto began visiting the DFN in late 2011 under the username Girl Me Thunter, where he garnered sadistic admiration from fellow users on account of his frighteningly vivid fantasy. He partook in explicit exchanges with many of them, but maintained close and constant contact with just three. The first was a 22-year-old mechanic from South Jersey named Mike Van Hees. The second was a British man named Dale Ballinger, who went by the username Moody Blues. The third was a man named Ali Khan, who split his time between the US, the UK, and his native Pakistan. In January of 2012, Gilberto sent Mike Van Hees a photograph of Alicia Frieza, an elementary school teacher and close friend of Kathleen's. The caption simply read, Five grand, and she's yours. Van Hees attempted to haggle Gilberto down to 4,000, to which he replied, I'm putting my neck on the line here. If something goes wrong somehow, I'm done for. 5,000, and you need to make sure that she's not found. She would definitely make the news. During exchanges with Ali Khan, Gilberto suggested taking his wife on a surprise trip to India, where she would be ambushed, murdered, and then cannibalized by the two men. We'll take turns with her, Gilberto wrote after sending Ali a photo of Kathleen in a bikini. During his conversation with Ali, Gilberto exhibited a shocking amount of hatred for a woman named Andrea Noble, 
who was later determined to have been one of his old college friends. It's personal with Andre, Gilberto wrote. She will absolutely suffer. I'm in the middle of constructing a pulley apparatus in my basement to string her up by her feet. It was never confirmed why Gilberto felt such animosity towards an old friend, but whatever it was, it inspired a murderous grudge in him that lasted more than a decade. By the summer of 2012, Gilberto was heavily engaged in conversations with Dale Bollinger, the British man who went by the username Moody Blues. Bollinger boasted of his ownership of a large industrial oven installed in an isolated cabin nestled among the desolate highlands of northern Scotland. Gilberto showed him numerous pictures of female friends and co-workers before Bollinger settled on a woman named Kimberly Sour. She's perfect, he said. It must be her. Once she's dead, I'll take her out and properly butcher her body, then cook the meat right away. We could even mount her on a spit like a rotisserie chicken. Gilberto later emailed Bollinger a Word document entitled a blueprint for abducting and cooking Kimberleys and listed the materials they needed to murder and cannibalize her without attracting attention to themselves. Gil listed assets and materials such as chloroform, a fully functioning vehicle, a length of strong rope, and a roll of duct tape a tarp or plastic sheet to contain forensic evidence and cheap sneakers that they could wear before burning to minimize the amount of forensic evidence. Gilberto had utilized the NYPD's database to peruse the files of potential victims. Records showed that from the summer of 2011 to the summer of 2012, Gilberto gained access to the files of three women, Andre Noble, Kimberly Sauer, and Marin Hardigan, an old high school friend. The files were mostly basic information, such as date of birth, eye color, and previous convictions. However, they also contained information Jill would have found very useful. Their home addresses. On July 22, 2012, Gilberto told one of his online companions that he'd meet up with Kimberly Sauer during a college reunion down in Maryland. She looked absolutely mouth-watering, he said. I could hardly contain myself. Just over a month later, Gilberto and Bollinger discussed methods by which they could abduct a woman named Christine Pontelli. Gil and Christine had never met, but since she was a recent graduate from his former high school, he most likely happened across her picture or profile via some kind of social media group for alumni. However, it's worth noting that Gil's attention seemed to have radically shifted from day to day. Not long after he fantasized over Ponticelli's kidnap and murder, he became almost entirely consumed with the previously mentioned Andre Noble. I swear, he wrote, if she lived near me, She'd be gone by now. Even if I got caught, it'd be so worth it. Gil seemed primed to act on the psychotic urges, but when the FBI raided his home in October of 2012, there wasn't a single scrap of physical evidence that suggested he was about to kidnap, kill, or cook someone. And despite frequently boasting of his efforts to brew a batch of homemade chloroform, there were no traces of the chemical or its manufacturer at the Forest Hills apartment. At his trial, one of Gilberto's defense attorneys, Edward Zass, laid out the crux of his legal argument. According to the client's direct messages, three different women were due to be kidnapped on President's Day, he said. That day comes and goes, but nothing happens. Then my client changes the proposed date to Labor Day. But once again, that day comes and goes, and nothing happens. Nothing happened because it's all just fantasy. Violent and disturbing fantasies, of course, but fantasies nevertheless. Befitting his profession, Edward Zass spoke calmly and confidently in the courtroom setting. However, he later admitted the difficulties of such a case. The only way you can defend this case practically, 
was to take on the burden of convincing this jury somehow really to a certainty that he could never do this, said Zass. But then how do you do that in a case where the guy is admittedly interested in this stuff? Eventually, on New Year's Eve of 2012, renowned New York forensic psychiatrist Park Dietz interviewed Gilberto in his holding cell. Dietz rose to fame through his assertion that Jeffrey Dahmer was of sound mind when he committed his string of horrifying murders, and it was his job to determine whether Gilberto was willing or capable of acting on his lurid fantasies. Following a lengthy question and answer session, Dietz determined that Gilberto had no desire to actually live out the things he discussed online. Dietz already knew from Gilberto's psychology file that the officer had been administered the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, a standard test meant to identify personality structure and detect signs of psychopathy. The test showed no clinical psychopathology, Dietz said, and that's not something I run into very much. Even the most unassuming of people can display psychopathic traits which means Officer Valor is either the most skilled manipulator Dietz has ever encountered, or he truly was of sound mental health. During his interviews, Gilberto openly discussed intimate details of his upbringing with Dr. Dietz and explained the origin of his bizarre and violent fantasies. As a child, he'd been taken to a screening of Jim Carrey's The Mask. The movie itself was amusing enough but afterwards, Gilberto remembered fixating on an image of Cameron Diaz, who at one point had her wrists bound before being tied to a tree. The mask would quickly become a younger Gilberto's favorite movie, though he never told anyone why he enjoyed it so much or why he'd play the same scene over and over again. By the end of high school, Gilberto was a frequent visitor to a website known as Mookie's Kitchen, infamous for its depictions of terrified young women being killed, butchered, and then cooked in cruel and creative ways. However, in his real life, Gilberto was never anything but quietly respectful towards women and remained a virgin until he met his wife, Kathleen. In fact, there are no available testimonies of him acting in a violent or threatening manner towards just about anyone. I saw the kinds of things Officer Valor was saying online, Dr. Deed said, and there's no denying how disturbing they are. I also understand how the evidence could be construed in that way that suggests that he might act on such fantasies but I see him as many steps removed from the kind of person that might start to take action. To classify someone as a potential offender, you need all the aggressive actions and character flaws that indicate they might be that one in a thousand monster we're all afraid of. But in Officer Val's case, I couldn't find them. During his trial, summations on March 7, 2013, Gilberto openly wept as he listened to his attorney describe his wife's decision to divorce him. His foolishness on the internet, his insensitive, ugly thoughts have cost him everything, one of them said. The conversations are preposterous. They are disturbing. They're disgusting. We should be upset that people are thinking these thoughts, but they do not constitute a criminal offense. In response, the state's prosecutor painted Gilberto as a reckless, impulsive man who was just days away from acting on his perverse urges. There is something incredibly wrong just on the fact that, with a New York City police officer talking about killing a high school student and then Googling to try to get information about her address, U.S. Attorney Randall Jackson said, that is a man who was trying to move a plan into action. Think about your favorite restaurant, Jackson continued. If you were to find out that the chef at that restaurant had a deep-seated fantasy of poisoning all of the people in the restaurant, and that night after night he was engaging in conversations with other people about how he could poison the restaurant goers, would you continue to eat there? 
Of course you wouldn't. Five days following summations, and after many hours of deliberation, the jury convened for their final court appearance. The foreman appeared visibly exhausted as he stood back up, took a breath, and read the verdict. We find the defendant guilty, he said, on the charge of conspiracy to kidnap. Gilberto shook his head in disbelief as he was led away by FBI agents, and many claimed the verdict was a clear miscarriage of justice. Were the jury even watching the same trial as us? Gilberto's mother asked one journalist. But in the days that followed, a member of the jury publicly defended their decision. We did what we did in good conscience, said Victor Panero, because we believed his fantasy was going to step into reality. In the same way an addict needs a larger and larger dose, he was needing things that were more and more real. He was bringing it into real life. At his sentencing, Gilberto received life in prison for the conspiracy charge and a maximum of five years for accessing the Federal National Crime Information Center database without authorization. Gilberto's mother was horrified and was a central figure in coordinating his eventual appeal, which shocked everyone when it was met with success. During June of 2014, a judge from the Federal District Court announced that Gilberto's conviction was set to be overturned, saying the evidence supported his contention that he was engaged in only fantasy roleplay. By that time, Gilbert had already served 21 months in prison, and the lesser conviction regarding unauthorized access to the NYPD database was commuted to time served, leading to his release. Since his exoneration, Gilberto has been incredibly open about his past and present and authored the book Raw Deal, the untold story of NYPD's cannibal cop. Amazon describes the book as a controversial saga of a man who was imprisoned for thought crimes and a look into an online world of dark fantasy and violence that most people don't know exists, except maybe in their nightmares. This is The Curator. I hope you've enjoyed today's scary stories. Until next time. <laughs>